Hello again everyone, my name is Mirabad Astaki, I'm a postdoctoral researcher in the Knight Lab here at the University of California, San Diego. And in this video I'm going to give an overview of the denoising and or clustering processes involved in marker gene sequencing data uh, within the CHIME2 environment. And show you what is involved in creating a future table that will be used as the basis of just about every downstream analysis you do in CHIME2. In the last lecture video, we went over the process of importing your raw sequences into CHIME2 as well as demultiplexing them as needed. So in this lecture, we're going to discuss the next step, which is the denoising and or clustering process that also incorporate a series of actions ranging from quality control filtering, trimming, resolving ambiguous nucleotides, dereplication of reads and ultimately ending up with a future table as well as its corresponding representative sequence files. So picking up where we left off from the last video, after importing and demultiplexing our sequences, here we have a sample, sample data artifact which contains a series of per sample FASTQ files. Following the denoising and or clustering step, which we will discuss in more detail in a bit, we'll be provided with two new very important artifacts. The first one is a future table artifact. Uh, and here I'm going to use the term future to refer to any sequence, any unique series of sequences that was processed following the denoising step. Uh, you may have heard these tables also referred to as OTU tables, taxa tables, species abundance tables, or something else completely. But in this series, I'm going to refer uh, to these as futures tables, again, for reasons that I'll describe in just a little bit later. This feature table is essentially a summary of all of our sequences organized as a sample by feature table. And the values in the table represent the total frequency by which a given feature was observed in each sample. So for example, feature one was observed a total of 42 times in the orange sample. It was found 12 times in the blue sample, 25 times in the red sample, and so on. The second important output artifact we get from this process is a set of representative sequences. This representative sequence file, which is of the type feature data sequence, is essentially a list of the unique features found across our entire data set and their corresponding DNA sequences. Unlike the feature table, this artifact does not hold any information about the actual frequency of these features uh, or their association with any particular sample. This file is used in downstream processes, for example when we want to construct a phylogenetic tree for our dataset or assign taxonomic classification to our features. So up till now we've been frequently using the term denoising, clustering, and futures. But what exactly are these and why should you care? So to answer these, let's start with a simple example. Here we have a hypothetical unknown sample that contains uh, several species of bacteria. Uh, here denoted by the different color circles. These species are found in various abundances as indicated by the size of their circle. So for example, the green species here is found in very high abundance in our sample, while the red species is found in very low abundance. Now in reality we don't know the true composition of our sample, so we plan an experiment to sequence the sample to try and figure out uh, perhaps what is inside of it. So as before, we extract the DNA and we perform a PCR to amplify our marker gene of interest. During this PCR process, however, several things 
can and often do happen that introduces some level of deviation uh, away from the true community composition. This can happen, for example, from PCR error, where small mistakes are made during the copying of the sequences by the polymerase. Perhaps a nucleotide is copied incorrectly, or an insertion or deletion occurs, which introduces a new artificial sequence that is different from the parent sequence. We can get formation of uh, chimeras, where two unrelated sequences are combined, or we simply miss a very rare taxa that was present in the original community, but we simply didn't have enough depths or uh, PCR material to capture the uh, rare taxa. In all these scenarios, a certain level of noise is introduced that blurs the original community composition. During the sequencing process, there is also additional noise introduced to our sample in the form of sequencing errors. For example, if a C nucleotide is accidentally read as a G, uh, sometimes barcodes can jump across samples, or even some amplicons from other cells or runs leak in, uh, introducing contaminated sequences, uh, albeit in very low abundances, um, but nevertheless they were never found in our original sample. So how do we deal with this noise in our data? Well, in the past, strategies to reduce this noise often involved a series of quality control steps, such as filtering reads with poor quality scores, trimming off the poor quality tails of the sequences, identifying and removing chimeras, or using curated reference databases uh, as a basis of accepting true sequences. And finally, the remaining sequences following these quality control steps were clustered into OTUs, or operational taxonomic units, based on some sequence similarity threshold. Uh, most commonly, 97% was used. One of the downsides of this approach is that two distinct but similar species in this case, take the blue and purple species, um, could ultimately be collapsed into a single cluster. These clusters can also contain a variety of spurious sequences, as uh, we discussed before, that were introduced as noise during the sequencing process. This also leads to the question of which of these sequences within each cluster should be used as a representative of that cluster for creating phylogenetic trees, for example, or taxonomic classification, and so on. There are still numerous clustering algorithms being used today, all with their own strengths and weaknesses. Most recently, however, there has been some significant development in the field with the introduction of so-called denoising algorithms uh, that do a substantially greater job, substantially better job of minimizing the noise introduced between our sample collection and sequencing steps. These denoisers attempt to model the error profile of our sequences based on their quality scores, the expected error rates, as well as the observed frequency of each of uh, these unique sequences. And so it uses these to model uh, and ultimately resolves, or attempts to resolve anyways, errors in our sequences. Using these, approach, uh, these approaches circumvent the need for clustering your sequences. And so what you are lof left with is a high resolution analog of those traditional OTUs. You can think of them as essentially 100% similarity OTUs, whereby even a single nucleotide difference between two sequences can be identified with good confidence. So importantly, these denoising methods, unlike most other OTU clustering methods, are also highly parallelizable, which makes them perfect for projects with large sample sizes, uh, which is increasingly uh, prevalent in the microbiome field today. 
So what are the products of these denoisers called? Well, unlike the product of uh, clustering methods, there isn't a single standardized name and the developers of each of these tools have their own preferred uh, terminology to refer to these exact sequence variants or the features. For example, the developers of the Data2 tool refer to their products as Amplicon Sequence Variants or ASVs. Uh, the authors of the Deblur tool refer to theirs as sub-OTUs or SOTUs. Uh, de developers of the MET tool from the Marine Lab uh, also refer to their uh, products as ASVs. And finally, Robert Edgar, the developer of the UNOIS3 method, uh, refers to his products, um, the product of his algorithm, as zero radius OTUs or ZOTUs. However you want to describe your data is up to you ultimately. But in the CHIME2 terminology, we simply refer to these as futures. That is because these terms, uh, at the time of their conception, were created really uh, with a focus uh, on using them uh, with target gene amplicon data. While CHIME2 is agnostic to the type of omics data uh, used as long as they can satisfy the requirement for their semantic type. This also allows the same infrastructure that here is used for 16S target gene data to be used for any other data type, uh, any other type of omics data such as long read marker gene data, shotgun metagenomics data, proteins or metab uh, metabolomics data, and so on. So you will likely hear the term future most fr frequently used within the CHIME2 environment. And while I personally think that the product of these denoising methods, so these futures, are a superior way of looking at our data, this is not universally accepted. Um, I know a few prominent members of the microbiome community that still prefer to use OTU clustering methods uh, in some circumstances and have made some interesting arguments against the use of exact sequence variants when it comes to uh, short uh, target gene uh, sequences. Now whether these exact sequence variants or OTUs should be used is worth its own lengthy discussion um, and is beyond the scope of this lecture but I will say that there may be some scenarios where clustering your data uh, can be beneficial to a specific biological question you may want to ask of your data. For example, uh, in, in this example data set, we have two distinct uh, green features in our sample and three distinct red features uh, that are found in various frequencies. And say that the two green features are bacteria capable of digesting plant materials, whereas the red features represent bacterial clades that can better digest meat. And perhaps your biological question is related to the composition of plant versus meat digesters in various gut communities. In this scenario, clustering these closely related species may increase the probability of identifying uh, statistically significant differences between your treatment groups, uh, largely due to the increase in power obtained by clustering the green features together uh, and the red features together. So in this particular scenario, OT clustering may be, and again, uh, this is always up for uh, debate, uh, but it may be desirable. However, even in rare scenarios such as this where OTU clustering may ultimately be desired, I would recommend that still the starting point should be with denoising your data and clustering the output uh, of that uh, into clusters if uh, needed. So yes, you can do both. You can denoise and cluster your data. The advantage of this approach is that we can still use our denoising tools, which have 
uh, by far superior quality control methods implemented in them to produce the highest possible resolution of our data and then cluster our features down to whatever similarity threshold that we want. Of course, you can always just use traditional OTU clustering methods without denoising first. Um, and in fact, if you have old data types uh, without quality scores, this may be your only option. But in general terms, we advise that as a starting point to use the denoisers and then the choice of clustering or not clustering should be strictly driven by your biological question and uh, this should be a user driven uh, choice. So this concludes this lecture video on denoising slash clustering methods in CHIMP2. Um, in the next tutorial session you will uh, get to learn how to perform denoising on your actual reads using CHIME2 the Data2 plugin. So thank you for joining, hope you enjoyed it, and see you next time.